Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. I'm Joy J. Moore. And speaking of I love to tell the story, uh, we got quite a story today uh, to tell, but a little bit of what happened. So King David, he brings, uh, uh, he unifies the people. He, br- uh, he puts God at the center of the people uh, in Jerusalem. God makes a covenant with David. That We didn't read that text, but God makes a covenant with David uh, that one of his descendants should always be on the throne. Then his son Solomon is a wise fool. His son Solomon becomes exactly what God told Samuel to warn the people in 1 Samuel 8 and 9, a king is going to be like. What is a king good for? They build, build they're good for taxes, they're good for wars, and they're good for uh, uh, taking your women and making them perfumers. And I think we all know what that means. Uh, and cooks and seamstresses and for forced labor. At the end of so- at when Solomon dies, uh, we get the same sort of story that we had last week with David. David, uh, the people came to David at Hebron to crown him. Rehoboam uh, goes to the northern kingdom at Shechem because there's really sort of a natural split between the tribes. There's southern tribes and northern tribes. And they say, listen, here's the deal. Your father made our yoke heavy. In other words, too many taxes, too much forced labor, a big government. And um, if you lighten the hard service of your father, all right, lower our taxes, less forced labor, less military conscription, less female conscription, we will stay with you. So uh, Rehoboam says, let me check with my counselors. The old men, the wise men say, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. But then you've got the young men, his the rowdies. And this is a story of toxic masculinity. Uh, they say, oh yeah, they want to... The, they want lower taxes and then in crude locker room language, the NRSV uh, translates it. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Um, but you all can see how gross that is. The stupid, toxic masculinity. Uh, this is uh, Catherine. Do you have, when you teach the story, do you have, do you play macho, macho man? Uh, <laughs> that would be good. I'll, I'll do that now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it becomes a story about how do you listen to God? He doesn't listen to God. He listens to this toxic masculinity. And there's other forms of uh, of bad human social behavior, uh, mean girl behavior, toxic masculinity behavior. But especially in a patriarchal, he listens to the wrong people. And that leads to civil war and the split of the people. And it says this comes from God. And then God is with both kingdoms once they split into north and south. But I think on the positive side is, how do we listen to God? God was speaking. God was speaking through the wisdom of the wise people in the community. I want to say it's not always the old people, though. Don't. Uh, I do think older people often do have a lot of wisdom. But really, it's how do you find the right ways to listen to God? So that is my question. In addition to what do you think about this text, my friends, how do you listen for God? Catherine, you said a couple weeks ago, God has never spoken to you out of a burning bush. Right. But God called you. So how do you listen? Where, where did those things happen to you guys? Well, uh, yeah, I was always the person who wanted a note drop from heaven or <laughs> a little bit of sky riding. I didn't think that was too much to ask and never got anything like that. But uh, I find as I get older, uh, God speaks mostly through... Um, uh, through the, the community, uh, through people I trust, wise people that I trust, uh, through my own inner promptings, uh, and and through prayer and through scripture. I think uh, it, it's not a science, and it's often not as clear as I would like. But uh, but yeah, surrounding yourself with wise people, uh, seeking their counsel, people who love Jesus, uh, and and. Um, yeah, discerning with them, I think, is in prayer uh, is uh, is one of the best ways to listen for God. How about you, Joy? 
I, it, it, I, um, I, I had an, ex I've had a couple of experience where they were pretty close to burning bushes. No, 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 actually burning bushes. But one of them that I love to tell is when uh, I left uh, to uh, move to Michigan. Uh, um, I grew up uh, Baptist, and when I went into ministry, I, I told my pastor that uh, I didn't think I was going to uh, stay in the Baptist church. And um, when I was wrestling with that, I was doing an internship in Michigan. Um, uh, and I was driving back and forth uh, between Illinois and Michigan, and I was trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. And I was beginning to lean toward uh, joining the Michigan Conference. And um, I was I was discerning. And uh, I started noticing that all of the campers uh, with Illinois plates and with Michigan plates had the slogan of uh, Michigan on the back of them uh, as bumper stickers. And at that time, the slogan was, um, say yes to Michigan. Ah. And I remember <laughs> thinking when I put the two and two together, Illinois plates, Michigan plates, I said, I'm driving on the highway on 94. I'm driving, I'm coming out of Indiana between Illinois and Michigan. And I said, really God, you can do better than a bumper sticker. <laughs> As I cross the state line, and there was a viaduct with a big sign on it that said, yes, Michigan. And I was like, okay, okay, because I was afraid I would get a split sky or, you know, something. It was like, I'll say yes, I'll say yes. <laughs> So was uh, it was it like a billboard or do you mean like graffiti that said no yes it Michigan? was it was the state slogan at that time was say yes to Michigan and it was on just as you cross the state line it was a viaduct and if you go there now um, oh I forgot what it is now but one of the members of my church because I shared this when I left pastoring to start teaching and um, she worked for the state of Michigan. And she said to me, she said, Pastor, she said, nobody knows this, but the people that, that work with me, she said, but I do think God is calling you to leave us now because you came here when our state slogan was say yes to Michigan. And we're about to change our state slogan. And at that time, they were changing it to something about Michigan and education. And I was leaving pastoring to become a professor. And mm -hmm. uh, and she was she was like I think God does talk to you through billboards. <laughs> <laughs> I wish right. it was. I, lo I love that. I wish it was one of those you know the billboards now that are big TVs, <sighs> and uh, be so so that they literally they know from cell the cell phones coming down the highway. Oh oh now we've got a bunch of this kind of people. Let's change it to an ad that might influence them. Maybe it would be say yes to Jesus would suddenly pop up. <laughs> that would sound like a scene out of Minority Report. I'm I'm afraid of that movie. <laughs> well, so I wonder if uh, I I think you're you're definitely right, uh, Ralph. And thank you for sharing that story, Joy. That that this is about listening for God. I think it it's also about servant leadership, right? Like, yeah. you you're absolutely right that uh, Solomon, even more so than David is that epitome of the King who takes and takes and takes right from, was it first Samuel eight, uh, mm -hmm. what, what Samuel warns them a King will do. Um, and I, I just, I really appreciate what the, um, what the older, uh, advisors say, this is verse seven. They answered him, if you will be a servant to this people today and serve them, and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever, right? Like, right. how important, I mean, I think we just, it's just come home to all of us, I think, how important good leadership is, right? Yeah. I mean, it just can make or break uh, a society, an economy, uh, right? So to have, you know, please God, give us people, give us leaders who are servants, who who are are in it not for their own ego, or at least not primarily for their own ego, but for um, for serving the people, right? I mean, that that's just a leader like that is worth their weight in gold, uh, and and we just uh, need to pray for that kind of leadership Absolutely. and work for that kind of and vote for those kinds of leaders. Absolutely. But I, I think, uh, um, yeah, to to get back to our our theme of covenant too, right? Like. 
David makes a covenant with the people uh, and is made king. Um, and his grandson Rehoboam breaks that covenant, right? He's, he's, he's not in it for the right reasons. He's not uh, willing to be a servant to the people. He's there to, uh, you know, to be the, the macho man, the, the, the man in charge. And that's not, uh, that's not the kind of leader that God desires. So unfortunately, uh, then it leads to the break, uh, breaking up of the kingdom and, um, yeah, and and then to idolatry, uh, exactly. the 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 second uh, second passage from First Kings twelve is about Jeroboam, who becomes king of the northern tribes and and seems to be a good man, uh, but but uh, doesn't put God at the center. Uh, in fact, builds two golden calves and puts them in the northern kingdom, uh, probably to represent the God of Israel. I think uh, uh, almost certainly, but uh, it it just starts. The northern kingdom off on the wrong foot, uh, and and they never um, they never fully recover from that. Well, there's I, a, okay, a, a echoing. There's an echoing too of you know the last time a golden calf was made. So if you if you don't know your story right. and you're not sharing your story, if you're not listening to your ancestors' um, own experience, and then then you begin to make the exact same mistakes that they made. And um, thank you for, for turning us back uh, to, to the text here because, you know, as Ralph was describing kind of this locker room ta ta uh, a talk, this kind of youthful, toxic ma masculinity, um, what you have uh, is I want to be this kind of leader and I'll show you. Mm. And what you're describing, Catherine, is what does it mean to truly lead? but to be a servant. And that's what Jesus will eventually say, right? Um, yeah. Those who, those who uh, will be first, um, uh, uh, the last will be first and be a servant. The very call of Israel is that the forming of the descendants of Abraham and Sarah are to form a great nation that will be a blessing to all of the nations scattered in Genesis 11. Their service is a blessing to the rest of the world. Being the leader of the people that Israel is to be is always in service to all of humanity, the world that God loves. And what we see here is the very leaders, the kings, not even serving Israel, which is going to make it impossible for Israel to be a blessing to all of the nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Um, I when we designated the verses, uh, we maybe stopped one or two verses. We should have added. So he sets up. He makes these golden calves, as Catherine said. They are to represent that probably that the God of Israel is invisibly enthroned on the calf. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is okay. the calf is probably not in the image, but that um, God rides a calf, which I know is weird. Uh, and so he puts one at Bethel, which means house of God, the other at Dan, which means judgment or something. And this became a sin for the people who went to worship before the one or the other. And then he made houses on high places. If you keep going, that really house means temple. He made temples Ooh. on high places and appointed priests from non-Levites. So the king of the north, Rehoboam, sorry, Jeroboam, Jeroboam. Is um, he he's afraid that if the people continue to worship God in Jerusalem, he will lose them. So he splits the not only does he split the kingdom, he splits the religion. Then, uh, mm. and this then is really what uh, th throughout the rest of the story, um, the sin of it's called the sin of Jeroboam. Uh, mm -hmm. For us, I think the issue is. Um, how are we worshiping false images of the true God in our life? Um, are we so are we so stuck on the liturgy? Are we are we, are we having fights about music? Are, are we saying no, you can't do this? So that uh, I wonder, are are we still worshiping the old pastor who's gone? Are we worshiping the pastor rather than God? It there's so many the ways. Building. 
The buildings. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm a United Methodist. Our big fight right now is over buildings, property, space. Mm -hmm. And we're tearing families and the denomination apart. And that's the... Um, there's something... I think the word I want to say is haunting. I think I can say that in, in October, right? There's something <laughs> haunting about how relevant these words are in our context today. And um, the haunting is, do I dare preach where it's as clear as it's written? Because I know the people don't want to hear that truth. And that's an idolatry in and of itself. For me as a leader, as a preacher, that I would not speak it so that it is clear and folks would realize that when you talk about toxic masculinity, there's a whole stream of the church that that indicts, as well as a whole stream of our political parties, a whole stream of our our, our um, society at large, that when I begin to talk about your question, Rolf, what are, what are the idols? What are we worshiping? When I begin to narrow in on that, am I going to put my leadership in jeopardy? But is it my leadership or is it the people's capacity to serve God? Not serve me or my denomination or my institution. But if I'm not telling this truth, then I'm breaking their capacity to serve God. I, I don't know, it's, it's haunting to me. <laughs>